Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Thank you for joining us today for our webinar. Um, today's webinar, we're gonna talk about data locality in distributed SQL. Uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give a little bit of a, a context around this, but you know, we're really excited here to have uh, you know, a customer of Cockroach Labs join us today as well. So we're gonna get a little more technical uh, in the second half of this, um, but, but we're really excited to talk about locality and, and, and how geo partitioning can actually help organizations do some really cool stuff. So um, I just wanted to give a little bit of uh, housekeeping first. Um, there is a QA panel uh, in Zoom. If you would like to ask questions, please do ask the questions in the QA panel. We'll be monitoring those all along, um, and I'll be I'll be looking at them when Kai is speaking um, to see if you know if I can interject questions at certain times as well. Um, Kai's a great speaker, so I don't want to disrupt him. He's he's really good. So, uh, but we'll get to most of them if we can at the end of the the Q at the end of the session as well. But uh, we will try to answer things uh, in line as it's happening. Um, the second, if you have any issues with the webinar or the platform of Zoom, uh, this is what we use, uh, please let us know via the, the chat. Um, so there's a QA panel and a chat window. Um, you know, just you kind of use chat to, to troubleshoot and QA to actually go through the questions. And then we always get this question, slides and video will be made available after the event. So we're recording this and we'll make it available to all those that attended and all those that registered as well. So without further ado, um, Thank you again for joining us. My name is Jim Walker. I am the VP of Product Marketing here at Cockroach Labs. Um, and I am joined by Kai Niemi from Kinder Group. Good morning, Kai. Uh, good morning, Jim. I'm Thanks sorry. Good, having... Yeah, good afternoon to you, or is it good evening to you, right? <laughs> yeah, good afternoon for me. Yes. I'm glad to be here. Yeah. So I, I love modern technology. I am in New York, and Kai is in Stockholm. So uh, this is a truly a global event for data locality. So kind of fitting the, uh, the topic, right? <laughs> so again, um, you know, the topics we're going to cover today, you know, I'm just going to go through, you know, geolocation and how we can actually tie data to a location and less about the technology and why people actually do this. This is kind of a relatively new concept. And, you know, it's, it's allowing people to think about business and address the needs in a, in a slightly different way. Uh, and then, you know, Kai is going to get into locality and how they use geopartitioning um, in practice at Kindred Group, which is, uh, you know, it's a really great set of information in terms of uh, how they think about their business and how, you know, this one feature has an effect on their business and, and kind of their approach of, of what they're doing. So i um, excited. So without further ado, let me let me jump into to some material. So, you know. I, I've, I've had a lot of conversations with, you know, I have some great friends who have been around this space and data for a very long time. And you know, get this stuff. And I have a very good friend, Sean Connolly, once said to me, you know, Jim, all data needs location uh, and time. Uh, and funny enough, I didn't really understand the location thing. I, I understand time. You know, we have time series databases. We, we have different ways of looking at these things. You know, I think we, we're using time series for lots of different reasons today. We're visualizing across time. And, and that made a whole lot of sense. Location, actually, I, I had less of an understanding of what that was because I think it was just, you know, Tying data to a location has been so difficult to do as a as an app developer that kind of one of these things is just just a problem, right? And so, you know, I took a step back at it and I said, look, at if we could truly tie data to a location, you know, shouldn't data drive where compute lives? Um, you know, if we know that you know most of our users in are in X Y Z region, um, shouldn't we know that you know compute needs to be increased in that region, or if they decrease or they move? How do we actually know these things and uh, you know the, the rate of access and all this whatnot so you know i feel that that location is kind of this critical variable that that does actually help define the future of data and so i'll start it that's the that's the ten thousand foot level that's like the top top level um when i think about kind of these 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 the bigger picture story but let's talk very practically of like why would somebody um you know tie data to a location i think you know, the first and foremost that people think about is kind of compliance and, and regulation. Um, you know, there's lots of uh, regulations across the world. Um, you know, each each state here in the United States has different regulations, but each country has different regulations as well. And I think one of the leaders in this whole thing has been Europe and kind of what they're doing around GDPR. Uh, and GDPR is definitely absolutely one of these concerns. And there are some statutes in there that talk about, you know, having data reside where it was created or, you know, localizing that data and keeping it protected in certain environments. And these things are actually really important. And, and each of these statutes have different language around 
you know, where data is domiciled, if you will, right? And, and giving that data some sort of control or having some sort of control, it's actually pretty important in these things because these regulations are starting to have teeth, which is kind of scary, right? But also I think, you know, there's, you can't underestimate the, the effect of internal governance as well. A lot of organizations will have just, you know, rules around their own data and, and where it can actually be stored and who has access. Of course, we have security and access rules, but also, you know, we get into kind of these rules of like where we store things, right? And so sometimes it, it just isn't about control, it's about reporting and oversight as well. So just knowing that data is in a particular location is often half the battle, right? And so I think there's this kind of, the, the number one is kind of regulatory and compliance and compliance having, you know, several different levels. Now, we actually, we, we created a report, uh, a report over the last couple of months, we published this, but we just talked about like, you know, where does it make sense to do business uh, in this world of, of data privacy. And we basically had a quick kind of ratio or score where we take, you know, compliance over or your GDP over compliance, um, GDP being ranked uh, one through five in terms of, you know, the, the just the pure dollars and uh, that, 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 that country or jurisdiction is, is there. And then we kind of analyzed, uh, you know, how, how do you comply with the laws of these particular, uh, you know, countries and, Start doing. We started. We start looking at it as kind of a ratio, and so in this report, it's kind of interesting. There's a heat map on where it makes sense to actually do business uh, in terms of you know regulatory compliance, and what is the the the, the reward versus the risk uh, involved in those things. And so, interesting report. I, I think it's part of our follow up to the webinar where we send this to people. So, um, I, and it's a good summary of all the regulations that are happening around the world are in this report as well. So, I'm sorry. Yeah, my slight commercial. We're five minutes in. Um, but no more commercials, we'll get right into tech. So um, so I think the second reason people like to tie data to location, and Kai's gonna talk a bit about this as well. Um, actually, all, you know, all three of these things are, are part and parcel of what's happening at Kindred, but you know, there's this kind of the, the we have these consumer expectations on our enterprise applications today. Um, you know, I, my parents use Facebook, of course my parents use Facebook, right? We all use Instagram. We use we have these kind of these these apps, and we have instant access to data all the time in our consumer lives. And I think enterprises are being forced to make sure that their applications are also uh, have the same sort of latency expectations. Now, latency expectations when you're a global business is a wholly separate thing, too, right? Um, you know, a lot of organizations want data to follow a user to make sure that it is close to them, so they can provide and shrink uh, you know, latencies and increase performance uh, and, and, and meet these kind of expectations that the consumers of these applications have. So tying data location does help you actually start to do that sort of thing as well. Um, sometimes organizations want data to follow a sun as well. Um, you know, the problem with doing this uh, is, is it's typically, and, and Kai's gonna talk about this, you know, like how do you tie data to location today? Well, it's kind of a, a mix of both application logic, logic and then the system architecture that sits underneath uh, via load balancers and whatever. Uh, you know, there's, there's things you can do within sharding, but then again, that's manual and it's difficult. And how do you update these things? How do you rebalance? How do you move one person from one location? That, there's a lot of manual interaction that goes into doing this. Um, I think a lot of people want to do it, but it's very, very difficult. And so our belief of cockroach is you actually do it in the database. And, Kyle will actually show you kind of how, how Kindred thinks about that as well. And then finally, and, and not always kind of a readily apparent reason is, you know, I think organizations do want to be hybrid or multi-cloud. I just think of it as multi-cloud. I mean, are you, you know, your private cloud, you want certain sets of data, you know, that live within your four walls, but, you know, you want some set of data to live in Amazon. And you know what, another one to live in, to say Azure or GCP. Um, because in different uh, regions or different localities, perhaps you have better uh, cost structures and you want to apply those cost efficiencies. And so could we actually start to tie data to various different locations and be truly multi-cloud? I mean, one of the promises of CockroachDB is that, yes, I can have a single database that spans multiple different clouds, both on-prem and public, uh, whatever that is. And so um, in so doing, can you also control, you know, the egress of data between these two locations so that you, you can minimize, you know, IO costs or egress, uh, you know, and these things. Um, are not simple to do, but we're at the advent of kind of the next generation of applications and the way that we think about systems architecture and multi-cloud is truly becoming one of these things that organizations are looking at. I think a lot of people are talking about it, um, but they're finding it difficult to do. And so for, you know, for us, we believe that, you know, actually addressing it at the database layer uh, has been has been critical to us. And, and again, I think Kai will show you exactly what's going on at, uh, at Kindred in terms of this as well. It is, it is a reality. 
Uh, you can have a database that spans the globe uh, across different across different places. So, <coughs> you know, just to summarize, um, you know, tying data to location in CockroachDB is really kind of enabled by a couple different things we do. Number one, you know, the architecture of our database itself allows you to kind of have these very small atomic units of a database and place them anywhere. Right? This isn't a, you don't have to run it on a particular cloud. We can do it anywhere. And then, you know, the, the, the entirety of all of the nodes within a cluster actually work together um, to actually understand where data is and kind of how these things work. I mean, if I have an IP address of a server, I know it's location, right? And so that's kind of, you know, what we're doing. Um, you know, we, we are able to tie data ah, to these locations via something we call a range. A range is, is, is a, a set of data that's tied to a particular node. So that's my intro. I just wanted to give a quick kind of level set on why people are going down this path. But I wanted to get more into, you know, a real world application of this. And I want to invite Kai on the webinar now. Good morning or good afternoon again, Kai. Well, good afternoon. <laughs> good. All right. So Kai's going to go through a little bit of what's happening um, at Kindra Group and, and how they actually use this technology to, you know, implement some of these business kind of or, or gain some of these business concerns as well. So take it away, Kai. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, continuing on to the next slide, I can just uh, uh, briefly describe a bit about Kindred. Uh, Kindred is actually one of the biggest uh, online gambling companies in the world. Uh, we are a multi-brand company offering 11 different brands, uh, ranging from 42 Red, Maria Casino, Unibet, uh, and so on. Uh, we have a fairly large customer base, around 24 million customers spread in different regions uh, of the world. Um, and we operate under uh, certain gambling licenses um, that regulates where we basically can uh, support or provide a business in terms of data centers and other, other things. Uh, our systems are uh, fairly large and uh, it's based on the microservices mostly. So we have a lot of moving uh, independent parts in, in the platform and we deal with uh, very large uh, transaction volumes every day and most of these transactions are, are financial transactions uh, where we have again strict regulations on, on how, how these are to be treated. Um, so part reason why uh, I'm here to talk about our use cases is because we are uh, currently addressing a, a sort of a big challenge and that is to provide uh, the Kinder platform as a global online gambling platform. Uh, and this is uh, something we are uh, looking into now. So the main objectives uh, in terms of globality can be sort of narrowed to these four, four points, and that is uh, uh, resilience for us to always be able to provide for progress for our key customer journeys. Um, and also in, in the event that we would have a correlated uh, disaster or disruption scenario for our data centers, we would still be able to make progress on this. Um, agility again is tied to uh, the ability to, to use a push button mentality on our, on our platform to deploy it to some new re-regulated re market in the world and basically be able to do that with a sustainable operational cost structure and not basically having the ability to run the platform with the same uh, number of people uh, running in different parts of the world. Compliance is very important in this domain and, and it, it can be very different depending on which part, which regions of the world we are operating in. Um, then when it comes to performance, if we want to be able to reach out to basically all markets in the world, uh, a key for a good customer experience is to have uh, very responsive systems. So performance is important to, to keep down the, the read and write latencies. And uh, basically uh, applying the same principles as content delivery networks do. Moving on, if we 
uh, when we looked at Cockroach DB, we, we early on saw what type of value adds it would bring to these uh, business objectives. Uh, when it comes to resilience, for instance, it's, it's a key component uh, when it comes to how we deal with our transactional data. Uh, and it offers the ability for us to have a full survivability of correlated failures. And even if some data center would, for some reason, start to run that degraded capacity, we can transparently rebalance that traffic uh, to other uh, functional parts of, of the larger uh, ecosystem uh, without assumptions on uh, replication delays or, or any kind of manual protocols to fail over traffic. It's, it's basically just perceived as a stretched uh, database cluster across data center boundaries. Agility we can address with CockroachDB in a sense that uh, we can uh, use the, the same guarantees and semantics that our, our platform is based upon today to a large extent. So we don't need to re refactor or rebuild everything because we still can use uh, SQL and we can use uh, transactions and strong consistency, which simplifies uh, developing applications. Uh, agility is also tied to uh, <clears throat> the fact we, we want to be able to utilize both on-prem and cloud infrastructure capacity. And uh, CockroachDB is, is a unique product that really uh, enables cross-cloud on-prem hybrid uh, distribution of, of, of the database. Uh, compliance is uh, <coughs> tied uh, closely, again, to the locality of data in many cases. And in, in CockroachDB, we have a unique uh, uh, capability called geopartitioning, which allows us uh, to basically pin individual rows in, in tables to specific geographies, uh, if that would be some constraint through regulations. Uh, now we show a bit more, few more examples of that further on. Uh, this again, the ability to partition the data to where, where uh, customers are basically located, also again, coupled to improving performance and mitigating the, the cross-link latencies uh, across continents. So we, we can move our, our uh, databases and our processing units, our services closer to customers, we can, we can get around these effects. Uh, <clears throat> moving on. So when we looked at this problem early on, one, one approach that we s declared pretty fast was that we didn't want to take a, a traditional path in this, uh, which is uh, that you typically have uh, a primary data center and some standby uh, passive capacity ready to take over traffic in case the primary has some outage. And then you take these pairs and basically deploy them to uh, different regions of the world. Uh, so what we saw in this is that it's, uh, it's very demanding on uh, standby capacity just blowing hot air, basically waiting for uh, disasters that may, may never happen. Uh, and also it adds a lot of complexity and risk into running uh, manual failover procedures and protocols. And then it's even worse when you need to actually fail back to your primaries and you reverse all those operations. And further on, this, this also leads to the fact that you will basically build isolated uh, silo structures of the platform which will be diverging and again uh, impacting the operational costs uh, long term. So what we are aiming for instead is uh, uh, what Google often refers to as multi-homing uh, deployments and in cockroach cases multi-active. And the key difference here is that all the hardware capacity resources we, is actively used to provide customer traffic. Um, and because uh, the data distribution is based on consensus-based replication, uh, and we ensure that we have enough capacity to reach majority on rights across these failure domains, we can always be able to make forward progress, even if we lose uh, or have a um, disruption of one of the data centers. 
this also enables cases where we can provide data center capacity at some edge location, uh, for instance, Australia, without having the, the same amount of capacity there because it's a smaller market than we have um, in Europe. So when we looked at this problem, we also saw early on that when it comes to our microservices, the ones that uh, provide the actual customer support for the customer journeys, they were mostly stateless. So they pro process requests, make some decisions, and then channel down those side effects of that process into the resource tier. And scaling them is typically quite straightforward. What you do is just you, you add more hardware resources and you scale things horizontally, which usually works quite well. And uh, you just need to ensure that your traffic is even and balanced across these processing units. So scaling the stateless tier is pretty straightforward, even if, you, even if we would uh, add more data centers than, than we have uh, today. So the real challenge in this is how, how do we deal with state in a consistent and, and performant and reliable way uh, when we operate the same platform uh, across data center boundaries and we could in theory uh, round robin the traffic across these. Um, and state in this case could be things we have uh, in uh, near time caches uh, in, in our databases and in our pub sub event uh, messaging systems. Uh, next slide. A typical uh, <coughs> approach to volume scale out uh, um, is uh, something I would describe here. And I, I want to bring this up because it's a parallel to how, how we perceive uh, the concept of, uh, of segmenting and sharding the customers to, to uh, or dealing with the customers in different parts of the world. So in a tr traditional uh, volume scale out plan, what, uh, what you would do in, in a system such as this is to, to look at what type of operations are performed in the system. And what we can see is, is fairly centered around customers. So there's not much interaction between customers themselves, which makes it a, a, a good point to, to apply segmentation and partitioning. So if we apply partitioning at this level, we can then sort of pin this or, 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 or move the data to where they are actually located. So then we can address to have a closer proximity to where customers are actually accessing the systems and be compliant with regulations. And this again draws a parallel to how content delivery networks operate to basically distribute things to the edges and provide uh, faster response times uh, because it's a shorter distance. But there's a problem uh, with this. Um, and in a traditional way, uh, how it's been done when you're going beyond the capacity of what a single uh, database system can offer, whether it's MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server, or something else, is that you, you start to shard things horizontally. So we segment those and organize the data into specific chunks. And then we need to apply some, some logic to, to route the reads and writes to the appropriate charge uh, based on some rule or partitioning uh, key in some way. And this is almost always quite complex and, and difficult to deal with and, 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 and get good performance in. Uh, and it will in inevitably <coughs> um, mix the, the logic that you do or build for business processing and then to make decisions on where to actually find customer data and, and especially if we need to run operations that spans different uh, customer partitions it becomes very tricky and all this logic needs to then be spread around in our case over 200 different services which is is not a very sustainable approach Uh, how this then is usually refined is that this uh, awareness of the, the partitioning logic is put into some middleware which takes on the responsibility to 
to uh, decide where requests are going. Um, but still, it doesn't address the core problem. It's still a challenge to do. Uh, you might relieve some, some burden from the services, but you, you eventually end up at some point realizing that what you actually built is the distributed database system that uh, at least takes on the same responsibilities. And again, you, know, it's, you can run into different scenarios when this becomes a, a real problem. And resharding is one sh such thing. And resharding is something that could happen if the policies around the jurisdictions change for, for our case. Uh, jurisdictions are not something that is always tied to geographies. Uh, and if, if these business policies change, then the sort of how, how data and where data is stored also needs to change. And doing uh, manual repartitioning uh, traditionally is, is uh, complex and it's risky and error prone and usually it takes a long time. Yeah, and Kai, like even in the, in the case of resharding and doing everything, there's still going to be some sort of effect on the application itself, right? I mean, in terms of like this, this, the, the, this manual approach, correct? Yes, uh, it's going to add, as I said before, the, the complexity uh, yeah. and to, to deal with the resharding and sharding logic. And uh, in doing so, it's going to take focus from developers to actually address solving uh, real business problems and stuff. And it's almost like its own major release, right? I mean, because if you're actually just reshard the entire database, you kind of have to have uh, different environments, you're testing it, you're making sure things work, and then you actually go live with it, correct? I mean, it's not like there's no re autom like, you know, real-time balancing, right? It's kind of what I'm going at, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. So it's like a complete nightmare. Well, some people like it, but it's a, it sounds like difficult to me. So, cool. Yeah, so uh, what I mentioned so far is usually something you, you can address when you're operating things from one, from one data center in some part of the world. But if we add yet another layer of uh, complexity to this and, and say that we also have these continental boundaries or uh, so you have the US, Europe, Australia, and so on. Um, another approach in this is to think in terms of these silos instead of actually sharding uh, at the data layer. But effectively, what you're doing is pretty much the same thing. You're, you're exposed to the same challenges in this. That it becomes very tricky to do uh, cross-shard operations and transactions uh, to get uh, or consolidated business reports from from different customer markets, uh, and again, this will push complexity to the developers to to be having to deal with different versions of their services and, and different data sets depending on which part of the world they deploy to. That in turn will impact uh, the operational cost structure to be able to to sort of maintain these different uh, branches of, of each and every service in the worst case. And eventually you will hit a scalability wall in this. Uh, so it might appear as a, a straightforward solution if you do it once or three times, but then it will quickly sort of get out of control. And even if you do this, you don't really have a solid solution to deal with correlated failure scenarios, unless you go for some failover, failback approach with some active semi-active passive uh, data center setup. So what, in relation to this, what we see uh, with Cartridge DB is that we can perceive our entire data set basically for our, for our customers, regardless of region, as one logical uh, key space. And, and this key space really spans geographies and the regulatory domains. So whether we deploy the platform in Europe or, or Australia, US, we can apply and be compliant, apply the constraints on the locality of the data and be compliant with regulations and at the same time get very good performance. So this, this manual sharding thing I mentioned before is really handled uh, transparently and natively by the database itself in terms of these uh, ranges uh, and the, the replication of these ranges. 
uh, we have also the ability to to control down to row level uh, through geopartitioning uh, which i will show a bit later but in in a more higher level this this model is really much more appealing and we we can also uh, see abilities here to to scale uh, reads and writes uh, in a horizontal scale out fashion uh, without running into the same limitations as you would do with uh, manual sort of sharding models. And furthermore, if you look from a service point of view, uh, uh, we don't no longer have this sharding logic or sharding middleware. Services only speak with uh, some load balancer, like NGINX or HA proxy, and they, they can basically go to any node in the system to perform their reads and writes. Uh, unknowingly actually where the, the data is physically stored. Hey Kai, there was a question that came in about um, consistency in this kind of environment. I, I'm paraphrasing, uh, but when transactions happen in different parts of the world or in different kind of regions, uh, and if it, if it you know, is on a similar record, like how does that work? Basically. Well, from, from consistency, Point of view, the database uh, runs at serializable isolation level uh, at all times, and uh, that guarantee is maintained <coughs> regardless of how information is partitioned. So, uh, and serializable isolation is the highest level in the SQL standard, uh, and this is honored uh, by the database in all transactions. So, if you would have uh, some, some transaction that is concurrent and in some way interleaving and conflicting with some other transaction, uh, it's going to apply the serializable uh, resolution to that and, and ensure that uh, you don't violate the asset properties and semantics. Great, thank you. <clears throat> so this diagram basically just shows a bit of the target picture on how we uh, could apply uh, the deployment of, of our data centers and Cockroach DB uh, and, and see things as a logical control plane to perform global transactions and local transactions from the domicile information. So let's move on. Uh, uh, so, in contrast to the previous diagram I showed about this, uh, when, when looking at, again, uh, top-down uh, from the stateless tier, starting there, uh, what we see is that for most of our services, uh, to, to go from a more or less single home deployment model to a multi-active globally deployed system is a fairly non-disruptive transition effort. Uh, simply because the fact that CockroachDB is a distributed SQL database. It provides asset transactions uh, and a familiar interface to watch applications. So uh, if a service is based upon these uh, constraints and rules today, uh, transitioning to this is a fairly straightforward approach. Uh, and of course, there's always challenges in doing that. Uh, and and for every workload that there is, you're going to have to verify that things still perform as they are expected. Um, but then going down in this tier to the stateful tier, what we see uh, uh, from a database point of view, we have the Cockroach database spanning logically across data center boundaries, again, providing these sustained semantics towards applications. Uh, but as I mentioned before, we also have state in other layers and other structures within the system. We have events flowing uh, between components and to our uh, data systems for reporting and analytics. We also have caches in different ways uh, and forms that uh, needs to be uh, invalidated and populated correctly. So state can be sort of expressed in many different ways. But what we see is that we have a very solid and scalable and resilient global control plane in terms of CockroachDB. 
and we can then, based on that, deal with local state in different ways. So whatever events are produced and consumed on a data center level, uh, these are typically handled locally. And the side effects of these are recorded uh, into the, the system of record, which is Cockroach DB, and thereby being made available uh, across data center boundaries. So just an example of how it could look again, we have four data centers in this diagram. And the first three from left uh, have some, some information which is arranged in these ranges. You can see those in the yellow, yellow circles. Uh, and then on the far right, the fourth data center, we also have uh, deposits ranges, which are colored in blue. So what we've done with those ranges is that we added replication constraints, the U partitioning constraints, basically saying that for data center one, two, three, we will contain uh, the replication to these data centers, whereas the fourth uh, uh, doesn't really have uh, redundancy in the same level because it's just a single data center. And then we have a gray circle here, which could represent registration. So these are not partitioned, they are only they are replicated, which means we will have a replica in each data center. And uh, for certain types of, of data, which isn't typically tied to customer context, that is how things can, could be, look. And then there's a small, small thing here with the law book and the yellow circle. That can be for certain jurisdictions where regulations say that this, this, um, this customer jurisdiction is not enabled or allowed to be stored in a specific geography, uh, like in data center one and two, we can decide to, to uh, put replication constraints so it's pinned to data center three. And this, of course, has certain implications if data center three would have an outage for these specific ranges. But for all other ranges, you will still be able to make uh, continue doing reads and writes. So, and uh, just to play out a simple scenario, we lose data center three for some period of time. Uh, in doing so, uh, it will not have an impact on on customer traffic, we can still be able to make forward progress for all the ranges, even on the, on the edge, uh, on the right side of it, set four. And on the next slide, we have uh, yet another example where that set four will have an outage. Uh, and in that case, uh, the, the ranges that would be domiciled to, to that region would be unable to make forward progress. Uh, because we don't have enough capacity uh, at that moment in that side. But still, all the other ranges for the others, so to speak, customer markets will be able to make more progress. And Kai, that, that decision for that, if that data center went out, was truly kind of driven by the, the context of the regulation, right? I mean, because data has to be kind of held in that, in that particular location. Is that kind of why that's set up that way? This is an illustration of uh, scenarios we, we see that yeah. we might end up with, having to deal with. And uh, our ability to really control this at, at database level, on the infrastructure level, right. um, and, and doing changes to this, in if jurisdictions change, uh, doing that in an online fashion without even bringing services down, without downtime, is, is a really strong property to have. Yeah, cool. And, Thank uh, you. Yeah. So uh, let's move on. And uh, uh, as a final example, I, I just want to show how, how things could look when we partition things. Um, in this scenario, we have three data centers uh, with three nodes each, and each range is replicated five times. So unless you say something special to to the database. What happens is that each range is diversified across these localities. And the localities are DC1, 2, and 3. So they can be laid out in a, in a totally random order uh, like this. Uh, 
And if we would take an example of uh, um, making a right on the top left to range four, uh, that right would take at least 30 seconds because uh, it happens to be the minimal communication link latency to, to data center two and three in average. Uh, and because each right needs to uh, have a majority of the replicas agree, acknowledge on that right before uh, acknowledging back to the client, you're going to need to make a cross data center uh, call. So and if we go to the next slide, uh, what we have done in, in a scenario like this is that we added constraints uh, the geo partitioning constraints on how these ranges are replicated. And in a case like this, we have uh, put constraints on range one, two, and three to data center one and two. Uh, and range four, we have sort of put constraints and domiciled entirely to data center three. And then we have range five here, which is not partition, it's just you replicated as it was on the previous slide. So it will be have its replicas sort of diversified across these three different localities. And this could be for reasons I mentioned that there are uh, regulatory constraints saying the customer data for this jurisdiction must be located in this physical location. Uh, or it could be some edge data center far, uh, far from the others. Uh, so in a read and write scenario for, for the uh, third data center on the range four, you will be able to make very fast local reads and writes. Uh, and if we look at the next slide, there's an example of the effects uh, in this. If we would uh, explore the idea of having uh, two of these data centers in Europe and and the third one in Australia. So Australia is pretty far away, so we would have 300 milliseconds at best uh, link latency there. So a natural access path to, to the ranges in Australia uh, would be locally from Australia, not from Europe. But in case you would make a write or a read to some range which is domiciled in, in Australia from Europe, it's still possible to do because you have the logical database spanning these, these boundaries. Uh, and it, by the same way, if you make uh, reads that touch the local ranges in Australia, for, for example, the range four data, you would have local read and write latencies. Uh, and I put a small star there uh, on range five. Uh, and and uh, if you recall, I, I said that this wasn't domiciled, it was uh, geo-replicated across all the localities. So you would have uh, range replicas available uh, in every locality. So um, in having that, we can provide very fast local reads uh, because of a concept called bounded staleness and, and reading from followers. So if we read uh, at a certain timestamp uh, a few seconds back, in time, we can provide uh, consistent reads <clears throat> within a certain time bound. Uh, and that way we can provide globally fast local reads. And that uh, is uh, something that's very uh, important and, and uh, beneficial. And it sort of maps well because uh, these type of data ranges that we would have are typically not tied to customers. And in that case, writes will be quite few on these data sets, but reads will be in the majority. Hey, so Kai, there was, a, there was another question here, and I'm, I'm gonna paraphrase again, sorry to the question answer, or the person who's putting the question out there, but, and uh, you know, I'll, I'll also qualify it. I know that you know, you're fairly mature in using this type of capability uh, and understanding ranges and locality and where these things work and their interaction with you know, just the natural latencies of, I mean, we can't really bend light, right? I mean, it's physics problem at, at some point, right? Um, yeah. How much care and concern or how much, you know, pre-planning did you guys take into consideration um, 
when you designed ranges and where data was going to live and this sort of stuff. It's a, that's a big paraphrase of the question, but I think I captured the, 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 sen the essence of it. Um, it's really kind of around how, how did you plan for this basically? Well, our, our plan was uh, centered around where we have our core customer markets today and uh, um, <clears throat> in relation to uh, our, uh, our customers in Australia. That was sort of the starting point in this. Uh, and after that, we also uh, uh, observed that the US market was getting re regulated and that is yet an, an extension of the Australian use case really to be able to provide uh, fast local performance in, in any part of the world and be compliant with at the same time with the regulations in that locality. So it was, a, it was more sort of based on uh, what, what we knew uh, in terms of the link latency distances uh, and how, how big our markets were in, in, in relation to that. Um, and if I'm correct, Kai, you guys have also done a fair amount of tuning along the way as well, right? I mean, this is kind of another one of those kind of dials that you can play with within the database to get things right, correct? Yes, we've done a lot of testing uh, and tuning. Um, and of course, we've done a lot of studies on how to approach this uh, in the best way. So we explored different alternatives on, on how we could deploy and uh, we basically built in the capability to, to, to offer to our business to, to say that we can basically deal with any topology that they would seem necessary. If, if there is um, uh, enough motivation to run free data centers in Australia, for instance, or, or start off with just one, we can support both of these cases uh, pretty transparently uh, in our platform. So it's more of a business decision on, on in what pace things should be rolled out um, and, uh, and whatever business priorities that guide that. But we have the capability to really deal with these different scenarios. We are not tied to, to having data centers very close to each other latency-wise. They can be distantly apart, even in Europe. Uh, and then across continents. So we have that as a guiding principle in the, in the design of, of this platform. And the geopartitioning feature really helps, helps out with that. Without geopartitioning, we wouldn't be able to really offer this to, to our business. It meets that agility concern as you had on one of your very yes. first slides, that, that being able to scale out pretty quickly. So cool, thank you. Um, and this really, again, outlines the target picture. We want to provide local performance, be compliant, uh, and offer that as a global service uh, in the best possible way. And with a sustainable uh, cost structure, operational-wise. I think to wrap, well, we just had... Yeah. Had okay. few, <laughs> yeah. So I think that wraps it. Um, and this is just a few bullets of what we saw as the very important uh, value adds in Cockroach DB. That it's fundamentally a solution that is really designed for these use cases. Uh, it's a fit for purpose uh, solution for us. Yeah, well, I mean, Kai, uh, you know, on behalf of Cockroach, I mean, thank you for being a customer because I think this is a you, this is a really good representative use case of how Cockroach DB can actually help a business. You know, just that I think the agility thing is one of those things. You know, it's like the the ability to do these things fairly quickly. Like, can you imagine it, as you guys expand into other regions, what it's going to take to actually scale out the data side of things and what that would look like with kind of a traditional database. Um, it's fairly complex, right? So. Yeah. Yeah, and I think that that agility thing is kind of one of those things where it's like, you know, meanwhile, you know, providing kind of, you know, ensuring that transactional consistency is happening and data resides in the right place and eliminating the operational complexity of things. Okay, I'm sounding like a marketer, but these things actually apply very well in, in your use case. I think. Very, yeah, I think very well. It's good. It's a good way to combat uh, complexity. Yeah. Complexity is always the primary enemy of agility. Yeah. 
And we already have a fairly complex domain, a complex ecosystem uh, already. And adding this globality aspect to it, running it in different geographies, doesn't simplify things. So we need to really see how we can contain that complexity of yield yeah. distribution. And yeah. Putting that into the infrastructure tier, into the databases, is an appealing option. Cool. Um, so I, there were a couple of questions, Kai. Um, I'm just going to go right to the end and just, just I'll, we'll, we'll end it up here. I don't need to do the summary. We, we've talked a lot about Cockroach TV. And actually, I love this question. So uh, one of the people in the QA has asked, um, what have been some of your biggest challenges or problems with Cockroach TV so far? So we talked a lot about how, look at, there's a lot of value. This thing all sounds really great, all these things, but like, you know, this is not simple stuff either, right? It's a bit of a paradigm shift and whatnot, and I think there are issues. So what, what are some of the biggest challenges you've had with Cockroach TV so far? Yeah, that's a very <coughs> good question. Um, well, one of the challenge is, uh, I think, applies to any transition effort you make from, from one database type to, to another. Uh, and that is to to have some predictability on how it will impact on different types of workloads. So we can make some assumptions that, um, that for certain types of workloads, uh, it will be pretty straightforward transition. And in other cases where uh, some workload is especially optimized for, for a specific type of database, you may run into some surprises uh, when you migrate. So, having the perception that it's just a drop-in replacement for, for anything and without any, any trouble and hassle is, is, is a false statement. Of course, you need to go through your, your systems and look at your workloads and, 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 <clears throat> and so on. But we also have a very wide spectrum of different types of components ranging from very transaction intensive to, to not so transaction intensive, but more of a semi-analytical nature. And uh, it's hard to predict the impact of this entire spectrum uh, up front. You actually need to pick uh, through this spectrum and, and try things out. So in some cases, it's been a, a challenge to, to, uh, <coughs> to get things working as we wanted, but eventually we sold these things. And today we can basically provide even better performance than we did before. Interesting, Kai. So you just answered the second question at the same time. So literally, the, the first question was, you know, what are some of the challenges? And, I, and then with the second question that came up is like, how do you import data from, you know, traditional databases into Cockroach? And then, you know, what are the processes around that? I think there's like a, you know, there's this initial import, which is a fairly tactical event, right? I mean, that's, that's pretty straightforward. But I think everything you were talking about just now is the stuff that gets of a concern, right? Like any migration from one database to the next is going to have operational or just kind of complexity to it, right? It'd be, yeah. you know, it, it, it's not really, it's not pragmatic to think that these things just work, right? We're, we're dealing with systems and data. It's just, you know, nothing is ever perfect, right? Exactly. But we need to put it into uh, perspectives also uh, and, and see that if we would have to choose a totally different type of data model and, and not being able to use transactions or SQL for that matter. Right it will be a very big invasive uh, yeah. effort to, yeah. to migrate to that. SQL, SQL, the SQL problem alone is one of the biggest, I mean, it's, it, the database has got to be SQL. It, that, that is the language of data. And I think that's uh, kind of one of those core things that, that I, when I look at a database, it's got to have that because otherwise my people can't code and the stuff I'm doing doesn't work. And so I think that the compliance thing is actually a really big thing too. So. It's familiar um, and it's not yeah. going anywhere anytime soon. Yeah. So I, you know, there was, there was one last question. We have two minutes left. I'm just going to ask it. Um, we don't have a whole lot of time. Uh, in the beginning, and again, I'm paraphrasing, in the beginning, I talked about multi-cloud as well in terms of like, you know, being on-prem and being in the cloud. Are, are you guys doing that today um, within Kindred? We are uh, uh, looking into doing um, multi-cloud and hybrid on-prem deployments uh, for this. Um, we also use, already using certain uh, cloud capacity for for data processing and analytics and reporting. Yeah. Uh, and we see that we're going to utilize that even more in the future. 
uh, our primary site and data center today runs on-prem uh, still. But that is uh, in the roadmap to look into it. Okay. Um, one more question. Uh, I'm going to take one more, right? And so um, how, how does backup this globally distributed data work? Um, and I'll, 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 I'll give a little bit too. Because it's distributed data and there's, you know, there's no such thing as active passive anymore, right? Kai, I mean, it's kind of all active all the time. Every single node is taking on traffic and data is replicated across the whole thing. So I think in real time, we start to think about RTO, RPO um, data is, you know, those things, those, those issues kind of start to mm -hmm. ease away, right? Just because of the nature of the database. But are you guys doing kind of, you know, backup as well, uh, you know, beyond that capability? Yes, most definitely. I mean, uh, just because we are distributing data, it doesn't eliminate the need to do backups uh, for a number of reasons. So one is that backups is really for um, uh, scenarios where we would have uh, human errors. You would accidentally sort of uh, destroy something and you have a place to go back. Uh, so backups is still something that is, is needed. And it's uh, natively supported in the database also. And we, are, we, we do have uh, strategies for how to uh, apply this also in a globally geo-distributed uh, deployment model. We're going to still use backups. So distribution doesn't really replace it in any sense. Yeah, and point in time backups become really important. So. Well, that comes to the end of our webinar. There was one or two more questions or smaller. I'll respond to those in email for everybody who did ask a question. And thank you all for asking questions and being uh, engaging here. Um, and, and thank you all for taking the time and joining us today. I know how schedules are. I look at my own schedule. Getting an hour of time is, is, is you know, incredibly valuable. And so um, we thank you very much. But you know, I want to thank you, Kai, for, for your help in this. Uh, you've been a great partner. I enjoyed building this out with you and having this conversation about all this stuff. So uh, talk to Mickey, my friend. Yeah, thank you. And thanks to the audience for yeah. listening in. So that's great. So that's the end of our webinar. Again, thanks, everybody, for joining. We will send a, a response out to everybody. We'll, we'll include the slides in the, in the, the video. will be posted soon. Um, and thank you, and have a great day.